So uh, thank you, Linda, for your invitation to be here, and thanks for the introduction. I appreciate it, and thanks to all of you uh, for, uh, for joining us here on Veterans Day. And let me tell you that uh, it's an honor to stand in for all of those who serve in the military and receive your thanks here today. Thank you very much for doing that. And I extend that same appreciation uh, to those who continue to serve. Um, and as we'll talk about here uh, today, those who are in training to serve at military academies. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to continue to show our gratitude uh, to, to those who really put their lives on the line to protect our country, our way of life, and the, the principles on which this nation was founded. So, without further ado, mm. um, you know, I served for only six years in the military, and uh, I saw no active conflict. Uh, so when I say I'm, ha I'm happy to stand in, that's, that's really what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, Mine was not the military service of uh, some Brookfield Academy alums who've served in Iraq or Afghanistan or other places. Um, I had it easy. And, and being on a submarine you know, reinforces that even more. You're not out in the desert. You're not uh, facing people who uh, have their guns pointed at you. You have to deal with some other challenges, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but none, uh, none that, that uh, I think stand up to, to what the members of our military generally put up with, as well as police officers and others, you know, fire department, firemen, uh, fire department personnel, all of those who have dedicated their life to serving. Uh, I'm very grateful, and I'm, I'm really proud that I am able to be counted among their numbers because I don't feel worthy, uh, but it is, it's a real point of pride for me. My pride is expanded uh, by having a son who is now at the United States Military Academy. I couldn't be more proud of my son, of our son, Tim, uh, who's, who's at the National <coughs> Academy. And as I, as I set out to, to sort of uh, fashion a talk that, that could share some of my pride and some of the rationale for it with you, um, I was really pleased to see that uh, Fox NFL Sunday helped set the stage. For any who caught it last week, Fox broadcast their show from the United States Naval Academy, oh. and it was beautiful. I, I was flabbergasted at the job that Fox NFL Sunday did in paying tribute to the military uh, through their broadcast at the Naval Academy. Starting with a, you know, uh, dramatic Tom Cruise narrated uh, <laughs> little bit, um, talking about how you know, many have portrayed the great people in the military in movies, uh, but you know this is where the rubber hits the road. Essentially, was his message. It's it's fabulous, and I would encourage all of you uh, to take a look for it on YouTube or uh, I think there were some, you know. Uh, uh, Fox NFL Sunday tweets about it that link to some video. It's really good, and it shows you uh, a lot more than I'm going to be able to convey about uh, the Naval Academy and, and life at the Naval Academy and the development of leaders um, and leaders who serve at all of these institutions. Like Fox, uh, I will use my experience at the Naval Academy as a parent, and my experience in the Navy to stand in for all service academies. I don't have direct experience at West Point or at the Air Force Academy, or the Coast Guard Academy, but you know what? Brookfield Academy has a rich group of families and others with great experience at those academies, and if you or your kids have questions or want more information, um, whether it's the Millers and the Coast Guard Academy or the Dobles and the uh, Military Academy at West Point or uh, the Jensen's uh, about the Air Force Academy uh, or any of a number of other families that I know I'm missing. Uh, those are great resources and I, I know they'd be happy to share their experiences with you. 
Uh, not to mention Nick Spaeth and his great team in the college office, uh, who I'll tell you were just <laughs> invaluable to Tim and to us uh, as Tim sought uh, an appointment to the Naval Academy. So other great resources. My talk, although I sort of advertised it as service <laughs> academies, plural, is really going to be focused on, on the Navy as a stand-in for all of those service academies, because that's where I have experience. So when I was commissioned uh, into the Navy after completing uh, reserve officers training at the University of Notre Dame, uh, I went straight into uh, a couple of little detours, but I went into the Navy's nuclear power program. Thanks. And I went in thinking, it's a government program. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can the government throw at me? I, I did pretty well here at Brookfield Academy. Uh, I did pretty well at the University of Notre Dame. I thought, yeah, hey, we'll just skate through this and <laughs> on to the next thing. I'll tell you what. It was absolutely the most academically challenging experience in my life, bar none. I mean, it was uh, lights out. I mean, it, as, as Ann could tell you, I, I used to have dreams about numbers floating in my head from the, you know, the math and the physics behind the nuclear engineering. And, you know, it was like sipping from a fire hose for the entire time. I mean, it, it was incredible. Um, and you would think that I would have learned the lesson uh, broadly that there are some things that the government can do pretty well in terms of training, but I really didn't. I, I thought the nuclear power was kind of the exception. And at the same time uh, that I was uh, sipping from the fire hose, I, I also had the first opportunity to really interact on a regular basis and, and live near uh, those boat school graduates, right? The Naval Academy officers. Um, and I thought, my gosh, what? why would these guys make the choice to put themselves in this, you know, almost prison-like setting from my perspective back then, right? All these rules and, and uh, all these regulations and, uh, you know, huge physical and mental challenges. And I felt like, I am much smarter than these guys. <laughs> I went to a private college, went through the ROTC, and look, we're both at the same place. You know, I thought that was it. I thought that uh, uh, that that I really had uh, had outsmarted them. Uh, and it wasn't until uh, really years later, and in many respects, it, it wasn't until Ann and I took Tim out to Annapolis. Um, that I really started to gain a full appreciation for how wrong I had been. Despite having all sorts of experiences in my time in the Navy that should have pointed me in that direction, but I didn't, you know, I didn't get, I didn't, uh, for, for whatever reason, it didn't sink in. I guess I wasn't all that smart after all. <laughs> so uh, when Ann and I took Tim out to the Naval Academy, we were waiting in line to go through security outside the, the gate to get onto the yard, as they call it. And uh, it, there carved into a rock is the mission of the United States Naval Academy. And given that I was stuck in line anyway, I looked down and, and read the mission of the Naval Academy. The mission of the United States Naval Academy is to develop midshipmen morally, hmm, mentally and physically, and to imbue them with the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty, and to graduate leaders who are dedicated to a career of naval service and have the potential for future development in mind and character to assume the highest responsibilities of command, of citizenship and government. Well, I was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> That's an aspirational mission statement, right? I mean, especially against 
what uh, former Milwaukee and uh, Cardinal Timothy Dolan recently observed in a talk he gave at the Naval Academy uh, against a backdrop of, quote, selfishness, narcissism, and a sense of entitlement that we see in pandemic proportion in today's culture. <clears throat> to me, the mission statement sounds refreshingly old-fashioned. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Brookfield Academy in many mm -hmm. respects, right? Mm -hmm. Refreshingly old-fashioned and counter-cultural. And I'm pleased to report that now with four or six months of being a Naval Academy parent under my belt, uh, I have found uh, that there's plenty about the Naval Academy, which is counter-cultural. And it's not just my experience as a parent, but it's also looking back on my Naval experience and kind of connecting the dots and figuring this out. So uh, relative to Naval Academy uh, parenting, here's how Tim spent his summer uh, starting on June 29th, shortly after graduating from Brookfield Academy, uh, as it's described by the Naval Academy. This is what's, what they call plebe summer, which is that initial training period where the kids arrive uh, at the Naval Academy and the first thing they do is surrender their phone if they've got one. Uh, and they, they are cut off from all communication except for, I think, two phone calls in six or seven or eight weeks or whatever it was. Poor moms. Poor moms. Poor dads. Poor dads. That's uh, and, and What's that? Best not to know. <laughs> yeah, definitely yeah, the case, in some, in some cases at least. Um, but uh, here's, here's how the Navy describes that, that first uh, training period. All midshipmen begin the four-year program with plebe summer, a period designed to turn civilians into midshipmen. Plebe summer is no gentle easing into the military routine. Soon after entering the gate on induction day, you're put into uniform and taught how to salute as part of the plebe indoctrination program. It doesn't say, but you also lose all your hair, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> For the next seven weeks, you start your days at dawn with an hour of rigorous exercise and end them long after sunset, wondering how you will make it through the next day. I think that's a, a pretty accurate um, encapsulation of the, of the process, although it leaves plenty of detail out, right? So I would add uh, that there's, there is a ton of rote memorization of important Navy facts and unimportant Navy trivia, uh, the customs, the rules, the chain of command, uh, and all of it, uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny to watch. These guys are given this little book that's uh, you know, probably a, like a three by five card, but it's about this thick. It's called Reef Points. And so these guys are standing at attention with Reef Points out here, and they're reading and memorizing this stuff. Uh, crazy. Uh, so uh, the, the, the memorization process is reinforced with really additional opportunities to excel physically. <laughs> uh, so if you miss a fact, you know, if you're one of your uh, uh, leaders, uh, what are they called, detailers, I guess, one of your detailers asks you a fact and you don't know it or you get it wrong, well, then it's push-ups. If you get it right, and your squad mate gets it wrong, well, then it's push-ups. If your squad mate gets it right, but somebody else in the company gets it wrong, well, then it's push-ups or running or, you know, whatever the, the whim of, of the detailer is. Um, and, and, you know, all of that um, delivers part of that important military message, which, again, transcends any of the service academies. And that is this idea of being responsible or in the Navy, your shipmate, or you know, in any of the other services, for those team members who serve with you. And it doesn't matter if you're successful, if they're not successful. And you're responsible for helping them to succeed. And it's part of that character of service that is imbued in these kids um, as they get to the Naval Academy. And it's a process that continues well beyond that that plebe summer. 
the indoctrination is challenging both physically and mentally. It's designed to produce young midshipmen who understand Navy tradition, the importance of the chain of command, and the importance of following orders, even when you're not sure they make sense. Given the culture that these kids generally come from yeah. across the United States, this is no small feat. I mean, it's just <coughs> amazing to see that transformation and to, to watch it occur in these kids. Now, I will tell you, service academies are hugely selective. And so it's not necessarily a representative group sort of across, you know, like it, uh, my brother teaches at a charter school, and they have to take students who are representative of the population at large. I don't think that this group is representative of the population at large, but certainly they're coming from all across the nation, from various cultural backgrounds, from various uh, geographic areas, um, and each of them is, is, you know, by the end of this process, understands these lessons at least to a large degree. So, uh, Tim, who entered the program in uh, good football shape from Brookfield Academy, promptly lost 15 pounds uh, as a part of uh, that, that training program. And that's no different than what we hear from other parents uh, as their kids um, go through the similar program. But as, anybody, as any who know Tim and might have taught him or experienced him at Brookfield Academy know, he just ate up this process of, of drinking in all of these facts and background and history of the Navy. He loved it, um, which is not necessarily to say that he loved every aspect of being there. I mean, it's a painful, <laughs> painful process. As these young men and women mature through their years at the Naval Academy, they'll continue to participate in this process, whether it's in plebe summer or in other uh, activities uh, throughout their time at the Naval Academy. But their role will change. Um, they'll not only learn the importance of, of following an order, but they'll learn the importance of how to give an order, even an order that I might not agree with or I might not want to give, right? And all of us have experienced that, whether as a, a parent or a, an employee, you know, those, those uh, things that, that are tough, you just got to buckle down and, and get it done. And, these kids experience that as well. And how to give a command and how to command with respect. And you can see it in Tim's description of those detailers and others who are kind of over him. He has great respect and, and just is effusive in his praise. Oh, this guy, he is just terrific. And this young woman is great. She's, uh, you know, does a wonderful job leading. And it's, it, you know, it's nice to see that process continue, not only seeing it from Tim's eyes sort of on the receiving end, but then seeing it through his eyes as, as these kids mature through the process. Um, on a Friday afternoon in September, we received a message from um, the parent of another Naval Academy midshipman in Annapolis with a short video of Tim marching in uniform in a formal military parade on campus, uh, or on the yard, as they call it. And the message read, uh, here's what your son is doing on a Friday evening as his peers across the country shotgun beers. <laughs> and I think it's a good summary. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it's not accurate, right? I mean, you know, we all have other children or, you know, who are not in the military academy and are not shotgunning beers, so that's not the point. But on average, these are kids who are deciding to voluntarily make the commitment to serve their country and to be trained in this setting, um, which, which is amazing and incredible. And so I love that message. I love the, the quote because I think it just it captures the essence of how the Naval Academy is countercultural and how the service academies are countercultural. Um, anecdotally, uh, I can tell you that the Naval Academy appears to have a more active faith life among midshipmen, women, and men than is typical of the nation as a whole, and in particular, 
than is typical of their peers. And this makes sense to me. The same type of student who's willing to live within the moral code associated with his or her faith is also more likely to be willing to forego the typical liberties uh, of his peers as a part of their commitment to serve. But I'll tell you, it was refreshing. And when we went to church out on the, the yard, you know, who's 10 rows in front of us but the superintendent of the Naval Academy? Um, it's, it is a strong and positive culture, which is not to say it's 100% that way, and it's not to say that it is immune from the other forces that are causing turbulence at great institutions of education across the country. But you know what? They're doing a pretty darn good job mm -hmm. um, in their development of leaders and of a culture of service and a mindset of service at the Naval Academy. I also realized, sort of as, as we experienced this, you know, that I'd, I'd seen the fruits of this effort myself in my military service, even though I came in sort of through the back door, right, the ROTC program, not through the front door, having to go the hard road through the <laughs> Naval Academy. Uh, as Mrs. Pryor mentioned, I had the good fortune to serve alongside some great military leaders, and I'll share just a couple of details about two of them. Uh, I worked as a personal assistant or an aide uh, to a brilliant, brilliant guy, uh, Admiral Dave Oliver. And he had a reputation as a sort of take no prisoners kind of guy, you know, rough and uh, tough. And um, th that reputation really uh, gave little hint of his thoughtful um, approach to managing people and issues. Um, I absolutely loved working for him. I thought uh, I thought I was going to hate it, uh, but he was absolutely great. Hi, welcome. Come yeah, join come us. Yeah, come on in. We have some seats up here. Thank you. We were at the middle school. I know you yeah. were, and we're glad you were there as well. There's there's, there's more there. seats up here. Yeah, come on up. We're just talking about uh, being Life a being a parent at uh, the, uh, of a naval academy midshipman, and sort of learning the lessons of uh, how the military. Uh, does a great job of teaching uh, service and uh, commitment and the ability to lead. So um, I realized after seeing it through Tim's eyes that you know that I had experienced this before. And, and uh, working for Admiral Oliver, uh, you know, it was easy to see. Uh, that there was more to him than this rough and tough exterior. He was, number one, he was brilliant. He had great, a great mind to attack problems and to solve them. Uh, number two, he was people-focused in a way that I really hadn't experienced um, before my time in the Navy. It was, it was just wonderful to work with him uh, and his wife. Uh, he, he's a guy who while commanding the attack submarine force on the west coast of the United States, wrote a book uh, that was a biography of his wife, which itself is a little unusual, right? <laughs> a Naval Academy admiral uh, to, to write a biography about his wife. His wife was amazing. Uh, she was a, a, another wonderful person. Uh, in addition, he talked the Navy into uh, being part of a Hollywood movie about submarines when the Navy's prior approach to submarines is no comment, no public information, no nothing, ever since, you know, really the advent of nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, and, it, and he wrote a, a second book uh, about leadership uh, that went on to become a text at the Naval Academy uh, for years afterwards. Um, and, you know, just absolutely a wonderful guy, all while doing a great job commanding uh, this section of our nation's military defense. After his retirement as a two-star admiral, he'd go on to become the CEO of uh, the company that builds uh, Airbus, uh, or at least the North American branch of EADS, which is a European um, aerospace company. Uh, he was also an executive at Northrop Grumman uh, and at Westinghouse. The second uh, great leader that I had 
uh, the opportunity to work with, uh, was the captain of my submarine, uh, a fellow by the name of Tom Fargo. Tom would retire years later uh, with four stars uh, as one of the highest ranking military officers in the United States. I was just lucky, just absolutely lucky to work with a guy of this caliber. Um, the, the wardroom, the group of officers on a submarine is small. There are a dozen of us. Uh, and, it, you know, I got to work alongside uh, Tom Fargo, uh, and it was a terrific experience. Um, Tom, after retirement, uh, Admiral Fargo would become CEO of a national security consulting firm, it would chair the boards of financial services company USAA. I think he just retired a year or so ago from. Uh, from that company that we see all over the television is, uh, and any, any football watching. Um, <laughs> he was also the chairman of the board of a, a shipbuilding company, Huntington Ingalls, um, and served on several other boards, Hawaii Electric and, and others. Uh, but, you know, more important than all that, it's just, he was just an absolutely wonderful person to be around, the most personable, the most focused on those around him uh, that I had experienced. While a submarine captain, it was Tom Fargo that took actor Scott Glenn under his wing to help him learn how to command a submarine for the Hunt for Red October oh, movie. Yeah. Glenn would later say that it was the easiest job he ever had. All he had to do was copy Fargo. Fargo commanded respect and authority over his men, but he was also incredibly relaxed with them. He never raised his voice. He had the utmost loyalty of his crew. He took into consideration the opinions and recommendations of his men. When he issued an order, it was carried out immediately, but it never seemed like a command. And although both these men are leaders who would inspire others to walk through walls for them, what I never fully appreciated before I went to Annapolis with Tim is that these two Naval Academy graduates are the personification of the training and the development that the Naval Academy aspires to deliver. Now, not everyone can have Tom Fargo as their model if they're getting ready to participate in a military movie. So part of the filming for Hunt for Red October was done at the submarine base in San Diego uh, where I worked. And one day before filming got going, Ann and I uh, had the chance to talk privately with a young Alec Baldwin, yes, the, the same yeah. Alec Baldwin, <laughs> <laughs> uh, about Navy life and military service. And I was frustrated that I was unable to convey adequately to him why I had chosen, or why anybody would choose, to put it in his words, to serve in the Navy. Afterwards, I scoffed, scoffed at his apparent inability to comprehend our mindset of military service. But you know, it, it wasn't until much later that I realized that I'd exhibited the exact same attitude relative to the decision to attend the Naval Academy instead of to come in through that back door of the ROTC program as I did. It's that commitment that the Naval Academy midshipmen and then officers made to develop morally, mentally, and physically, and to take on the highest ideals of duty, honor, and loyalty, and to become leaders who are dedicated to naval service and to be able to assume the highest responsibilities of command, of citizenship, and of government. They had chosen the Naval Academy through a deep commitment to serve. I'm so pleased and uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm proud of Tim uh, for making this choice. And, uh, and I wish you, Tim, and uh, Abby Dobo, and all who are in training at a service academy or at other programs, to Noah Jensen um, and all of those who are currently serving in the military, especially from our BA family, uh, 
and all of those who have in the past worked to secure our freedoms, especially those who served us with their lives. So I thank you, uh, Linda. I thank all of you. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be with you uh, on Veterans Day. So thank you. Thank you.